G'day guys and gal. The Necrons have the best gear, the biggest armies, and the most outrageously overpowered weapons and technology. This combined with the fact that there are dozens of Necron dynasties with countless Necrons each should mean that the Necrons are able to bend over the setting of Warhammer 40k and have their way with it. However, once again diversity is the enemy, as each Necron dynasty would seemingly rather use its god tier weapons against each other rather than the actual threats to their empire. I bet the Silent King is really regretting giving back free will to his people. I'm dead serious. Like the only reason why the Necrons are having a hard time impacting the setting at all, despite being able to bend time and space like it's Stacy's mum, is because they're so petty that they've been spending 90% of their resources sabotaging each other due to 60 million year old feuds. Just read The Infinite and the Divine and you'll see what I mean. These petty feuds have destroyed dozens of tomb worlds and ended entire Necron dynasties, which is pretty funny, so I thought today I would cover every single Necron dynasty in the Warhammer 40k setting. I'll start with the main fun ones, and then after that we can just go by our alphabetical order. As a disclaimer, I am not Egyptian, nor am I a soulless space robot, so I will 100% butcher 95% of the dynasty names in spectacular fashion. I know at this point that's more or less a given, but if you don't like it, well then you can just eat a bag of dicks. Let's get into it. Starting off hard and fast, which we love, we have the Sagzara Khan dynasty, which is the dynasty that the Silent King, aka the oldest being in the galaxy, aka a Necron that should be able to body a Primarch with one hand, but will likely just get his ass kicked by a named Space Marine to make them look good. When the Necrons were unified and extremely overpowered due to all being enslaved to the Silent King's will, the Sazer Khan dynasty was number one. They held the most power and influence as their leader controlled everything. However, when the Silent King fucked off to have a 60 million year sook about accidentally dooming the very soul of his people, the Zazeda Khan suffered greatly, partly due to the unlucky shit such as fat warp storms, but also because the other Necron dynasties were pissed off that the Silent King took their free will away and convinced them to give up their souls. Hence, Zazeda Khan tomb worlds were often plundered and sabotaged by other dynasties. To make matters worse, Sazadik Khan woke up late compared to the other dynasties, hence couldn't defend themselves from all the other pissy Necrons. However, with the return of the Silent King, the Sazadik Khan has shot back up in the rankings with them quickly vassalizing numerous other Necron dynasties. They're known to be regal and snobby, seeing the galaxy as theirs and them being the number one dynasty, which you know, they kinda have a point, but nobody likes the snobby kid. Next up we have the Nilhailak dynasty, that nobody would give a fuck about if it wasn't for the fact that Trazin the Infinite, Overlord of Solemnes, Keeper of Random Bullshit, and the only good thing to come out of Matt Ward, was a member of it. Now so whilst Trazin and his Pokemon trainer tendencies is highly entertaining, and even has its own video, the Nilhailak dynasty are actually solid players on the main stage. They were initially all about defending their borders and preserving their resources, which actually worked out pretty well for them. Since the return of the Silent King, however, they have joined forces with him and have been kicking Chaos's ass to the curb. Oh yeah, and they have their own preserved head of a future telling extinct Xeno, hence they can accurately predict the future. Nice. Anyway, back to Trazin. He is the overlord of the tomb world of Solemnes, which is more or less a planet sized museum. Whilst Trezin isn't much of a patriot to his dynasty, he still serves its interests as long as those interests align with his. Now onto the Sawtech dynasty, which has the unique benefit of having two badass fan favourite Necrons running around in it. First of those is Orokan, who is a wildly overpowered chronomancer. This dude can travel through time like it's nothing, and if the stars align, and I mean that in the literal sense, he can also temporarily turn into a god powerful enough to rip a transcendent Catan shard limb from limb. The other, who somehow might even be more dangerous than Orokin, is Imhotek the Stormlord. Imhotek is considered the greatest Necron warlord other than the Silent King, and he is one of the few dudes to successfully clap the Black Templar's cheeks. Imhotek was not always the Lord of Sawtech though, he was awoken prematurely by the heavily corrupted and demented lords of the Sawtech, who believed he could gain them a bunch of power and whatever other bullshit Necron lords like. Instead he was like, you guys are retarded, I'm in charge. Hence has taken his dynasty on quite the aggressive crusade. The Sawtech dynasty are known for their honour and mercy. Worlds they subjugate are often allowed to exist as vassals, even if they aren't Necron, whilst enemy Necrons are taken over rather than destroyed. Imhotek will even allow enemy warlords, like Helbrecht, chapter master of the Black Templars, to live if they put up a good enough fight. Next up is the dynasty with some of the cooler colour schemes, the Manayak uh, dynasty. 
Although these guys lack fan favourites, they were one of the Silent King's favourite dynasties as they basically did all his dirty work. They, along with the Sawtech, are the most horny for war out of all the dynasties, and their Pharon, which is a cute robotic way of saying Pharaoh, has the nickname Mother of Oblivion. Goddamn. Whilst the Sawtech are conquerors, the Maniac ugh, are destroyers. They do not capture prisoners or vassalize worlds, they execute and destroy. This has made them pretty unpopular amongst the dynasties. Being a ruthless asshole has that effect, and the others even plotted to destroy the Maniac ugh, while they slept. However, the Silent King knew that one day he would need his evil ass looking executioner again, hence he spent extra care ensuring the Maniac ugh, would survive to see the Great Awakening. Despite his care, however, large swathes of the Maniac ah, were infected by the Flayer virus, and a lot of their lords and commanders more or less had their personality matrixes corrupted. Not a big deal though, at the end of the day, an axe doesn't need to be a charming fellow. Now onto the Mephlita dynasty, who were known for their intense fetish for stars. They were able to harness power from stars and even knew how to weaponize them. They could literally just supernova a star pretty much whenever for a laugh. Ironically, their pharaoh Karik the Eternal was assassinated in their sleep by Eldar assassins. Yeah, not so eternal now, buddy. As such, whilst the Mefret were having a mini civil war over who takes their place, their star weapons are inactive. Probably for the best. Next up is the Nefrek dynasty, who are uber uber rich. No shit, their Necrons are gold. Whilst most of the Necrons wish to return to their flesh and soul state, some Necrons, including the Nefrek, we still ascend to beings of living energy, which is actually pretty doable. High ranking Nefrek overlords are able to temporarily assume this state, whilst even the lowly warriors are able to temporarily increase their energy and power. This energy state is what Orokin learned how to achieve, but Orokin being Orokin took it really far, and he's more or less of a god when he's like this. The trade off is that the state is very hard to maintain, and nobody has figured out how to make it permanent yet. Just because the Necrons don't have souls, doesn't mean they don't have personalities. Just look at the Navok uh, dynasty's paint scheme. No, this is not them being wannabe white scars. The Navok, before getting their souls sucked out, would rub the blood of their enemies on their face. They kind of have a reverse fear of blood. If you aren't bleeding, they're pretty chill, but as soon as they see any blood, they instantly enter into a berserk rampage and won't stop till all organic life nearby is destroyed. So they're more like Blood Angel wannabes, if anything. Due to these violent delights, they are beginning to see violent ends. The Navok have managed to get themselves into a vicious war with pretty much every single race in the galaxy. To make matters worse, they've been infected by a Nurgleide biomechanical plague which is ravaging their tomb worlds. Yeah, good luck Navok. So those are the main dynasties. Time to go for the miners. <coughs> Wait, that came out wrong. First up is the Agadakatha Gal- <laughs> First up is the Agadakath- <laughs> First, first up is the Adagath dynasty, who no one knows much about and gives even less fucks about. Their only notable bit of lore is that they lost the tomb world of theirs to flayed ones. Wop wop. Then we have the Atun dynasty, who control the territory around the original home of the Necrontia. As such, they have a ton of ancient treasures and artifacts, which I bet Trezin has been slowly borrowing from them without their knowledge. The Atifmur dynasty is a great example of the diversity of the Necrons. I mean from like a policy standpoint, not from them being, you know, yeah. The Umithl are big fans of subjugation and vassalization of non-Necron races. For example, they once defeated a Hive World. They then offered terms of peace that if accepted, turns the Hive World into a slave world. Not the best outcome for the humans, but there's definitely worse ones. In Necron lore, it always seems like they're able to kick Elder ass without too much drama. An example of this is the Adok the Bigir dynasty's invasion of an Eldar maiden world. Despite an alliance of Exodites, Craftworlders and Harlequins, the Necrons were able to fight through and steal the world spirit's spirit gem, which more or less spells doom for the Eldar Exodites living there. Due to the bad karma they amassed from this, a Void Dragon Shard escaped their captivity and destroyed a dozen Adok tomb worlds before they were able to trap it back in its master bowl. The Arin Marok dynasty is one of the many that have pledged allegiance slash servitude to Imhotep the Stormlord. They did this due to the threat of an Eldar war host that looked like it would be able to wipe out the Arina Marok. Although from what I've seen, the Eldar beating the Necrons is not really a thing, so I don't know why Arin Marok was worried. A bit of a spicy one, we now have the Bone Kingdom of Drizak, which I talked about in my Ghoul Stars video cause, you know, they live in the Ghoul Stars. 
This is a Necron dynasty completely filled with flayed ones. The only Necron there that isn't flayed is the overlord Valgul, who for some strange reason has opted to stay in his kingdom with his severely cooked subjects. Now onto the Chanavoka dynasty, who were once a powerhouse, but due to a large amount of its tomb worlds being eaten by Tyranids while it slept, as well as mankind exterminating a whole bunch more in the war against said Tyranids, these dudes have had a rough time. The Divanak dynasty is another one of Imhotep's bitches. They had a rough awakening, as it took nearly half a millennium for them to figure out how to make coffee, hence they were quite tired for a while. They also lost a bunch of their tomb worlds to warp storms. The next one is an interesting one, the Empire of the Severed. They are called this as during their long ass Necron hibernation, radiation storms hit their tomb world and basically burnt out all the Necron's consciousnesses. The AI that acts as the guardian of the tomb world was also damaged but not wiped, hence it took control of all the Necrons before believing itself to be some kind of god. This new hive mind Necron dynasty has sallied forth and begun to conquer and absorb neighboring tomb worlds, whilst also conquering other races and bending their will to its own. In a very uncharacteristic bit of Warhammer lore, the Hybek dynasty got turbo raped by the Eldar. Basically, the craft world of Alatiok predict the awakening day of the Hayruk dynasty, fuck my voice is going to be sore after this, hence when the tomb world awoke and their vaults opened, the disorientated Necrons were met by thousands of Eldar warriors in combat formation. The Hayruk were torn to shreds. In an act of hilarious pettiness, the Necron dynasties of Kara and Raitak both sent assassins to kill each other's leaders. Both assassin teams were overwhelmingly successful, hence now both dynasties are leaderless, which in Necron terms means completely fucked. Now we have a dynasty that would actually make a super interesting comic book. We have the Kansu dynasty. This dynasty were one of the few who rebelled against the Katan and refused biotransference. One of their noblemen, called Raxian, decided however to go through with the transference and he was mad that his people did not. The Katan and Necrons were able to crush the Kansu dynasty and force whatever survivors that there were to become Necrons. These surviving Necrons were then used as cannon fodder for every battle. Eventually only Rakstan remained as the noble Necron realized the extent of his folly. When the Necrons rebelled against the Katan, Rakstan went Super Saiyan against them and to this day vowed that every Katan Shard will be imprisoned. Hectic shit. Now we have the Kardanath dynasty who are a dynasty of Necrons called the Kardaneth. Yeah, look, not all dynasties have fleshed out lore, or even any lore for that matter. They say that trust takes years to build and seconds to destroy. This is very true for the Nekfist dynasty, who used to be massive traders and dickheads before biotransference. After that, it was kind of hard to portray people when the Silent King's command module was telling you what to do, but it didn't go away. Even though their sneaky ways are over 60 million years old, the other Necrons don't want to have anything to do with the Nekfist. The Neochiris dynasty, although not super powerful, is quite famous. This is because the Neochiris dynasty were the ones that activated their world engine, which is like a Death Star. It took a huge amount of space marines and guardsmen and even the extinction of the Astral Knights chapter to bring the world engine down. While this was a big win for the Imperium, it's been implied that the world engine is just one of many. The Great Necron Sleep did a lot of damage to a lot of dynasties. It caused countless Necrons to be corrupted and destroyed, as many of the surviving dynasties scrambled to assert their power. This issue did not affect the Ogobodk dynasty however, as they decided to install backup generators and have especially fluffy pillows for their sleep, meaning that they were one of the few dynasties who awoke into more power and influence than when they went to sleep. The Oltep dynasty, however, had a very rude awakening. When they arose, they found the core of their planet had been replaced by a demon prince of corn. As demons weren't a thing last time the Necrons were around, this was a huge what the fuck moment. The Necrons fought against this unwelcome intruder, however, they were no match for the horny corny boy. Metal skulls still count as skulls, right? The more lore I read about the Necrons, the more I realize how much the Eldar fucking hate them. Another example of this is the Orosk dynasty, who have been heavily infected by the Flayer virus. This was a deliberate infection caused by the Elder Craftworld of Alatiok, which looks like it will be the end of the Orosk dynasty. Now we have the Oruska dynasty, who are just solid. They aren't huge, but they aren't weak. They consider themselves rivals of the Sortek dynasty, which is a bit dumb considering the Sortek dynasty has Imotek. The only main thing going for them is the fact that the Oruska control the Celestial Orrery, which is an extremely overpowered device that could end the entire galaxy if you accidentally sneezed on it. 
The Sonic Dynasty have a pretty cool bit of lore. Basically, when the war in heaven was about to end, a massive battle between the Sonic and the Eldar occurred above the Sonic's tomb world. Although they barely won, the Sonic didn't have time to clear all the rubble from the battle. Hence, their planet has billions of tons of Wraithbone and Necrodermis orbiting it in a spectacular fashion. Next up is the Sekatema Dynasty, which is just another of Imhotep's bitch dynasties. In a bit more of an ironic battle, we have the Shemok Dynasty who fought against the Iron Hands towards the end of the 41st millennium. I mean, I guess it's not that ironic. I thought it was a fun fact, all right? Get off my back. The Sobika Dynasty has quite the bloody tale, which I'll do my best to compress and make understandable. Basically, they had this uber overlord during the war in heaven that was able to solo kill demigods and even old ones but he got kind of pissed off when his cousin stole a kill or some shit. Anyways, when he went to hibernate with all the other Necrons, he couldn't sleep properly due to how mad he was about the kill steal. Hence, his tomb order woke to chaos, as all the other Necrons were filled with his rage despite him still sleeping. Then another overlord awoke, who was supposed to be in command, but wasn't, because the angry sleeping god tier overlord was in command. But then the new overlord got command anyways. Then he decided to declare war on the dude's kill stealing cousin. Yeah. Fuck yeah, dude. The Thot. Sorry, the Cot Dynasty are horny Necrons. And by horny, I mean they have harnessed powerful radiation death crystal powers, which are supposedly pretty good. The Varich Dynasty made the questionable decision to establish their tomb world on a water planet, meaning that they are now awoken covered in rust and other erosion, which you would expect from 60 million years of being submerged. Now onto the Zonthar Dynasty, who keep biting off more than they can chew. Firstly, by fighting and losing to Crawford Uthwe, and now by engaging the Imperial Night Houses of House Terran. Zonthar, mate. Start off with the Greenskins, then fight the Exodites, and after that, then you can challenge some fucking wizards and mechas. Dumb dog. Finally, we have the Zandrogar dynasty, who are obsessed with <clears throat> who are obsessed with returning to the flesh. Most Necrons are keen on this, but the Zandrogar uh, fucking whatever take it to a whole nother level, as they consistently kidnap and experiment on other races in the hope that they figure out the key to being able to once again shit, piss, and eat. There are a lot of Necron dynasties which ironically hurt the overall Necron empire. No one wants to be a bitch, and when you have dozens of powerhouses, each led by an egomaniac, it's going to be hard to actually get shit done as a whole. If you enjoyed the video and you want to support the channel, then Patreon is the place to be. Where only $1 per month give you access to a boatload of Warhammer Hentai. Hit the subscribe button, then hit the real subscribe button for more metallic content. Join the Discord for more memes, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.